So hello, everybody. It's uh, great to have you here. I'm really excited to be hosting this first think tank. Uh, it's our first uh, effort to uh, bring uh, urban air mobility stakeholders from all over the world to join our conversations about urban air mobility in Latin America. Um, I'm thrilled to be uh, uh, joined by a very interesting set of people here. We have, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Edgar Rivera. He's the Director of Regulations of Aerocivil, Colombian's Civil Aviation Authority. He's a lawyer specializing in aeronautics, space, transportation, and procedural law, has represented Colombia in ICAO, university professor, and has published articles on aviation and law, private pilot, and he's a reserve major of the Colombian Air Force. We've got Jake Schultz. Uh, he's, uh, uh, Jake works in aviation as a technical analyst and associate historian. Starting in the early 90s, he worked with Molt Taylor in his archives, which culminated in the publishing of A Drive in the Clouds, the story of the aero car. We've got Tamara Bullock, uh, years experience in the aeronautics industry. She's founder of the aviation corporate and public affairs firm Altitude. Uh, joining us as well is Natalia Barbour. She received her PhD in transportation and is currently a postdoctoral associate at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. She studies travel behavior that relates to new mobility adoption and usage. And we've got Michael Diamond, uh, managing partner of Nexa Capital Partners, an investment banking firm focusing on aerospace and capital markets. Uh, his Washington DC based company has conducted urban air mobility investment feasibility studies for 75 of the world's largest cities, many of which have private capital needs for infrastructure and Six of them are in Central and South America. Uh, joining us as well um, is Andres Bejarano, our uh, Head of Investor Relations uh, for Varon Vehicles. So uh, uh, for everybody, please note that this session is being recorded and we, uh, it will be posted in the Skyscraper webpage, varonvehicles.com slash skyscrapers. So you can revisit this session and any other previous think tanks at any time. Attendees, um, you are able to submit your questions through the questions and answers button on the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we will have an eight minute slot in which we'll try to answer as many questions as possible between all panelists. Please note that the language of this think tank is English, but we, we, we have live interpretation both in English and Spanish right now. You just have to go to the uh, interpretation button on the bottom of the screen and choose your preferred language to listen to live interpretation of this session in your language of choice. Por favor, note que el idioma de este think tank es inglés, pero tenemos interpretación en vivo tanto en inglés como en español. Usted solo tiene que ir al botón de interpretación en la parte baja de la pantalla y escoger su idioma preferido para escuchar interpretación en vivo de esta sesión en su idioma de preferencia. So, um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, we uh, want to get started with um, our, uh, our launch of our first conversation points. Um, and, uh, the title of this think tank is The Value of Latin America as a Region for the Nascent Urban Air Mobility Industry. Um, and we wanna talk about uh, what Latin America as a region brings as a market opportunity for this new industry, urban air mobility. And we wanna uh, join that, and I wanna hear everybody's uh, comments around the mobility problem in Latin America. The mobility problem here has several layers that we don't see in the developed world. Uh, layers such as defectuous infrastructure, very high levels of pollution arising from the uh, vehicles in general. Um, we have a criminality uh, layer on top of that as well, unfortunately, but very real. And it all creates pressure, pressure uh, to, to find new ways uh, for mobility. And going into the third dimension is one of those uh, obvious uh, spaces to occupy. But we also have another problem uh, in the world, and which is one that urban mobility may very well be entitled to tackle, which is the city growth problem. So it's that um, systematic inability from governments to provide proper mobility infrastructure to alleviate the pressure for growth in cities. So um, with those, uh, I wanna give it over probably first to Jake, he's our historian here. And I think it would be very uh, appropriate to have an insight of not only what is changing today around the enabling technologies that are allowing us to talk about these new generation 
aircraft and the new ways to integrate into airspace through software. Um, but, but what this reality that I just described opens uh, in terms of doors for the actual implementation of the uh, many decades old dream of flying cars and now uh, urban air mobility or uh, advanced air mobility in general. Cake. So welcome everyone. Um, so I got to know Malt Taylor who developed the aero car back in the 50s. And um, his perspective was very global as well. Um, his concern was mobility. And in particular, he was a small pilot, but he liked to fly. He wanted to fly further, like you can in a plane, than you would normally go as if you would drive. But he was tired of getting to an airport and not having a way to continue his trip. So it's kind of the last mile problem where you, you can get somewhere in a plane, but then you're, you're outside of town at the airport and how do you get to town? Um, so what his solution was, and several other people uh, back in the 50s, was to develop an airplane and an automobile that's a combination that would be able to drive on the road and would be able to fly. And he did that with the aero car. There was the Waterman Aerobile. There was a lot of other aircraft, the Airphibian. And they were legal to drive on the road. And then they would have wings and you could attach them and fly. But you required an airport to do that. And you, so you only had so many places you could start and complete your journey, but then you could get around in the vehicle. What you can, what's the difference now is there's more the sense of being able to start and stop from more locations, whether that is a vertiport or whether that is your own backyard. And, and so things have changed. A lot of the, the technology to allow the vehicle to drive more safely or fly more safely with autonomy. Uh, without having to teach every single person to be a pilot. Um, and so there's a whole lot of history of certified flying cars, the Airphibian being one of them, the Air Car being one of them. They were, they were certified by the FAA as flying automobiles, but they were limited in their use because it could only start and stop from an airport. So what we have now is a lot more vertical lift, a lot more emphasis on the vertical lift and being able to use electric propulsion, uh, things like that to get you the autonomy, the electric propulsion, the battery technology to get smaller groups of people from point to point. And uh, that's the kind of thing we're talking about mostly these days, not so much flying cars, but vehicles that can get you further than you would normally be able to travel in either gridlock or in a car or in some sort of an urban where you're limited to the bus route or you're limited to the railroad tracks of wherever the train is going. Absolutely. I mean, and I'm really glad that you bring the term flying car because uh, we're trying to move away from it. And uh, of course, refer to them as vehicles. That's what they are. Uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. It's a, definitely a new generation. Tamara, uh, what can you give us from your perspective in general as a no, uh, uh, you know, expert in the uh, aeronautics industry overall um, in terms of that value that... Uh, that you can see in this region of the world uh, where we're trying to implement our first systems. First of all, thank you for the invitation and honored to be among this extremely reputable panel. Uh, I was uh, just listening uh, to Michael and uh, as I come from a business that deals with, first of all, perception and then reputation, I would focus on the customer as well. And uh, when we talk about uh, flying taxi, that's something that's very much understandable to anyone in Latin America or anywhere else in the world. When we start talking about electrical vertical takeoff and landing, that's where we need to do a lot of work. So uh, I think we need to start from the basics, at least in my component of this discussion, raising awareness about what this industry is and how it helps customers, how it helps cities, how it helps governments and Latin America would be no different to any other region in the world. The only uh, thing is that when I remember back the discussions about urban air mobility, they all started from Latin America and uh, cities like Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro were the first ones to be mentioned in any kind of topic back a few years ago when all these discussions started. So I think a lot of global companies are focused on this region and you starting this uh, dialogue with multiple stakeholders and creating this ecosystem 
really goes in the right direction of raising awareness about the necessity of developing this industry, whether that starts in five years as initially planned or in 10 years, eventually it will, and it will become very popular uh, as long as we take care of the perception of the industry as safe and we uh, come up with the pricing that will work for the majority of the people who will be end users of the eVTOL or flying, flying cars. Absolutely, uh, safety uh, is priority number one and that's of course uh, very related to uh, the regulations either existing or new ones that we need to create um, and, and of course to all the certification processes that, uh, that uh, follow uh, on the air vehicles and uh, all these systems uh, in the operations. And, and I think that's a great point to uh, send it over to Edgar Rivera. Uh, what's uh, your view on the entire um, you know, uh, uh, intention of uh, bringing urban mobility to Latin America and with the role of the Colombian government there and the Colombian CAA? Bien, como antecedente, sería mirar entonces la, la situación eh, eh, de una ciudad como Bogotá que no dista, no dista mucho de las ciudades donde, de, del resto de ciudades eh, latinoamericanas. Eh, Colombia tuvo una experiencia muy remota eh, o un intento muy remoto en cuanto intentó transporte en el, se intentó transporte, se hizo transporte en helicóptero en la ciudad de Medina entre sus dos aeropuertos. Desde el punto de vista económico no fue muy exitoso. Eh, de manera relativamente reciente eh, eh, se intentó en Bogotá también el transporte en helicóptero un poco imitando el ejemplo que ya eh, se ha mencionado de ciudades como Río, eh, como Río de Janeiro y Sao Paulo. Y se avanzó y se, se diseñó toda la estructura de transporte, se contaba con las empresas que estaban dispuesto, dispuestas a hacerlo, pero hubo dificultades de tipo ambiental y un poco reacción social y fue imposible. Además que ya se había visualizado que este transporte eh, no, no, no llenaría las expectativas que puede llenar un transporte como el que se está proponiendo acá, porque el transporte usando helicóptero es un transporte costoso y estaba destinado únicamente a, a, a cierto sector prácticamente en condiciones VIP y no es lo que se quisiera para un transporte de, de movilidad aérea urbana. Y de manera pues que eh, esto, lo, esto lo hace atractivo, el hecho de que, de que un sistema de movilidad aérea urbana pueda eh, desde el punto de vista económico ser más accesible al público desde el punto de vista ambiental sea más amigable podría resolver los problemas de movilidad que tenemos en ciudades como las nuestras una ciudad eh, de unos 8 millones de habitantes cuya infraestructura vial lastimosamente no creció al mismo ritmo que, creció, que había crecido la ciudad y esto hace que el transporte eh, urbano sea lento, el, el, la movilización vehicular sea lenta, el transporte mm, eh, público no, eh, no ofrece condiciones óptimas de, de tal suerte que entonces hay una tendencia muy fuerte a preferir utilizar el vehículo particular y esto genera congestión. Eh, una solución indudable sería entonces eh, la movilidad urbana. Esto hace que eh, ciudades como Bogotá sean atractivas, pero esta realidad no es única de Bogotá, o sea, es la realidad de, de la mayoría de capitales latinoamericanas. En Colombia pudiéramos hablar de, de, de otras ciudades más que, 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 lo, que lo justificarían, pero también podemos hablar de la mayoría de, de capitales latinoamericanas. De modo pues que eh, cuando pensamos en este momento en movilidad aérea urbana, de entrada estamos eh, en este instante, pasando de la ficción a la realidad, eh, ya esto es algo tangible y definitivamente eh, se muestra como, como una solución óptima a los problemas de movilidad que muchas ciudades, al menos en el entorno latinoamericano, tienen en este momento. Eh, en cuanto a su, a su regulación, supongo que de esto habría oportunidad de hablar un poco más adelante, pero me anticipo un poco en cuanto a la regulación. Eh, el, 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 digamos, desde luego la regulación habría que ajustarla porque la, toda la regulación ha estado eh, pensada en aeronaves que se mueven de una ciudad a otra, de un país a otro, volando a gran altura. 
habría que hacer eh, pequeños ajustes y, para articularla y, con esta nueva necesidad y sobre todo para articularla también con las regulaciones locales de las diferentes ciudades eh, en cuanto a su movilización, porque definitivamente el, tra el, el transporte, este transporte aéreo tiene que articularse eh, con los demás modos de transporte y con el resto del transporte urbano. Volviendo con, los, con el ejemplo de Bogotá, Bogotá a pesar de, 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 de su sistema de transporte urbano que es un poco eh, precario, tiene una, una condición muy particular, es que tiene articulados todos sus modos de transporte, eh, funcionan como uno solo, todo, eh, el transporte masivo, el, 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 el transporte de, de buses colectivo, todo el transporte funciona articulado como uno solo y en muchas otras ciudades desde luego esto tendrá que ser así y la regulación tendrá que permitir que el transporte aéreo urbano también se articule y, y, y sea fácil la, 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 la transición o la conmutación de un modo de transporte aéreo sea fácil en el evento en que fuera necesario, de tal manera que la regulación tendrá que permitirlo. No sé si más adelante haya oportunidad de hablar de la regulación, por eso no ahondar en este aspecto. Muchas gracias. That's, that's great. I mean, and I, I think that gives us, uh, uh, throws the ball to Natalia because uh, Edgar is touching points that are really uh, at the core of our entire conceptual design. And it has to do with the fact that we need to service people, right? And, and what's your view, Natalia, into the idea that uh, there's a new way that occupies airspace, a low altitude airspace over the cities, but that actually services people and not only corporate VIPs, and such, but, uh, uh, and, and that would be tackling the mobility problem. What's your view there in, uh, as, as Edgar was saying, uh, that, that this should be a tool to actually uh, solve other problems. And I, I wanna refer to the city growth problem too. Uh, as I was saying at the beginning, that the lack of the, uh, the incapability of governments to provide that uh, uh, proper mobility infrastructure and to maintain it. So what's your view there on, from the urban perspective, from the actual city point of view? I believe that in order to evaluate any transportation system, a couple of things need to be considered. In Latin America, I find that you mentioned that there is a problem of safety, there's the problem of congestion, environmental impact. When you combine it, that, that does not allow you to use transportation in a way that delivers opportunity because we don't want a transportation system just to have a transportation system. We want transportation to have access and that access further perpetuates economic growth because it's an access to opportunities and attractions. So Latin America has all these things because it's not about solving a wrong problem with the right solution. It's about asking the right questions and solving the right problem. So if we somehow can solve congestion and safety, we can also solve other problems that cities, cities right now are, are grappling with. And I find Latin America to have all these characteristics that could potentially provide success for urban air mobility. And with that couple points, I'll conclude. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we are looking at Latin America as, as a place to implement our first system, because we see, and we've talked about this with the Colombian uh, authorities, we see the pressure for city growth and we see the pressure for a solution because the, the, uh, the overall mobility problem is creating such a big pressure and, and a big impact on people's quality of life that uh, the need for a solution is really, really large. So, so we see that and we translate that into an actual market opportunity. And, and, uh, and this gives me the perfect opportunity to ask Michael as an investor in the aeronautics industry and as a person who has studied many, many cities around the world for the specific implementation of urban air mobility, including Latin American cities. Um, what's your view from the economics uh, point of view? Because uh, uh, one thing as Natalia says, is to have a, a system that actually solves problems in transportation. But another, another reality is that that system has to be, uh, its economics have to be right for it to actually work and prosper as an industry. So what's your point of view there? I mean, what do you see in Latin America? What do you see in other cities? We know 
that there are other cities that are maybe implementing urban mobility first, but we also see that Latin America can be within those uh, first world candidates. What's, what's your point of view there? Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I very much enjoyed the comments made leading up to uh, this moment. Um, South America, in particular, um, Sao Paulo, um, has been a world leader uh, in urban air mobility of a certain version with helicopters uh, for the last two decades. Uh, I've had the privilege of flying uh, from the international airport in Sao Paulo to Embraer uh, in a 30 minute flight that would normally take two and a half hours by uh, taxi. So there's proof positive um, that uh, there's a market opportunity, but you are right. Uh, today, using the existing technology, this is a service that's really only affordable uh, by um, with business travelers. So it's not universally contributing to some of the points that Natalia had just um, made. But with, uh, and to Edgar's uh, point, uh, the new eVTOL technologies should be able to um, uh, reduce the cost of uh, mobility uh, with, um, with dramatic uh, effect. And uh, helicopter op operators today are operating on the margins. Charter helicopter companies don't really make a lot of money. Um, but being able to move into um, uh, electric fleets should allow them to uh, cut their operating costs in half. And um, that will have a dramatic impact on ticket prices as volumes go up. Certainly as automation picks up and we're able to use uh, more dense uh, uh, airspace above cities, uh, this will also tend to drive uh, ticket prices down to the point where people should be able to afford this um, with a uh, with a uh, ticket price of about what an Uber uh, taxi charges. So there, every city is different. We did study 75 cities, including nine in South uh, and, and Central America um, in the last year. We're updating this research all the time. And uh, the, private, the private capital requirements uh, make a good business case for uh, private uh, funding to come into cities and pay for the infrastructure. And this is very good news for taxpayers and residents uh, who would uh, otherwise have to absorb these costs through uh, public uh, contribution. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and that's a great uh, point because uh, all this, uh, all these enabling technologies that uh, we were talking about at the beginning and that Jake was referring to uh, actually make very complex machines that are those traditional uh, aircraft like airplanes and helicopters simply disappear and, and they become uh, software complexity, which is way, way easier to build and way easier to maintain. So we are seeing a new generation of aircraft being born uh, uh, and urban mobility sits on the shoulders of drone technology. And this is very recent. Um, and that's definitely one of the biggest reasons why uh, we are talking about urban air mobility and advanced air mobility uh, uh, today. I don't know if any of you guys want to jump in with any comments on that. Yeah, Felipe, I just wanted to add, uh, apart from the technology point of view, there is a huge opportunity for Latin America there, as probably Alberto is going to talk in the second panel about Airbus and the supply chain that exists today around the world, very small per percentage of that supply chain actually comes from Latin America. And I think with the urban air mobility development of the electric fleets, but not only fleets, the whole um, environment around uh, the organized transportation in a new way, uh, even retailers, when you go to your vertipod, you want to buy something, you have a retailer there, new opportunity for them. You need designers, you need architects, uh, you need the whole line of different businesses to unite and integrate in order for a customer to be transported from point A to point B, whether it's uh, Bogota or it's Mexico City or any other major city. So it's, it's much bigger opportunity than we can see it on the face of it, I think. And especially in these times of uh, very devastated economics around the world, I think uh, we are opening a new chapter here that could be something even potentially one day bigger than the commercial aviation, because there, as we know, the recovery of commercial aviation will last long and uh, people 
after this pandemic will also be more keen uh, to uh, go in a smaller vehicle rather than in a huge metro car which had like 500 or 1000 people but as other speakers said it will be a lot down to pricing my i may jump in i have a couple immediate thoughts on piggyback of what tamara just said and in terms of delivering the need uh, Latin America has such an immediate need for transportation in terms of economic growth and lack of infrastructure and the density supports it and density is important and needs to be there for any transportation system to be viable. So in terms of developing new transportation system that learning curve is extremely important. How fast can you learn and how fast can you scale and then once you see if something works. Is it transferable so in terms of transferability, can you transfer that technology to other cities? And if so, what has to be changed? What has to be modified? Modified to be successful system elsewhere. And then another, the spatial stability of human behavior. How different people behave in Latin America, because that depends on their needs, and they behave elsewhere. So those are some of the questions that will need to be answered, probably through empirical uh, trials to get the system efficient economically and that will deliver the, the right service to the right kind of people. That, that's uh, great, Natalia. And that's exactly what we're trying to approach here from uh, by doing things in a simplistic way, a, the simplest way possible. Uh, path of least resistance to, to simply try and implement UAM and learn and acquire that know-how you're talking about. I want to remind our attendees who are joining us right now and uh, they're listening in. Uh, you are able to submit your questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we'll have an eight minute slot in which we'll try to answer as many questions as possible between all panelists. And uh, also remember that uh, uh, the language of this think tank is English, but you can always uh, choose your preferred language uh, for live interpretation by uh, clicking on the interpretation button that you have on the bottom of your screen as well. So I, uh, this so, sorry, screen, I, I, I yeah. want to come in and say, Part of the passion that is around urban air mobility right now is people's inventiveness. And there's been hundreds of flying cars that have been studied and some have been built and flown over the years. But what's amazing is there are hundreds being studied right now. And one of the reasons is nobody really knows what the, what the answer is. Um, I mean, for traditional commercial aviation, we've evolved to uh, wing, pod modded engines, pressurized fuselage cabin, I mean, very, Pretty much a jet looks like a jet, looks like a jet for very good reasons. But the urban air mobility, two rotors, six rotors, eight rotors, folding rotors, um, you know, electric with a hybrid, uh, all electric. I mean, there is so much innovation going on. And to be able to take that to places like Latin America and to work out some of the, the um, how to modernize it and how to make it ideal is, is really an exciting time. And that excitement brings young people who are in, out of school, engineering and such. It brings people who have financial ability. It brings people who are excited about the possibilities of the future that are more exciting than just envisioning a future that's the same. Absolutely. And I wish we had four hours to, uh, for this panel. But uh, uh, I mean, those subjects are really, really exciting and definitely uh, And it is, it is a Wright Brothers moment like you all said, because you're talking about dominant designs. An airplane has always been that way. Now we're saying air vehicles can be something different. And that's the revolution that we're seeing, uh, which is a mixture now between aviation and, and uh, mobility, city planning. And that's really interesting. I want, I want to uh, uh, target the conversation now uh, to a different point that also uh, we want to reflect the, the value of Latin America for this industry. And, and, uh, uh, a very fundamental thought here, if you look at cities like uh, Bogota, Panama City, Lima, Santiago, Medellin, and, and, and you measure the dimensions of their urban structures, you'll notice that give, given we're taking a few miles, they're all about 16 miles across. But in order for you to do that trip, it would take you in many cases two, three, or maybe more hours because of that mobility problem that we were talking about in all of those layers. Now, when we talk about urban mobility in the developed world, for example, in the United States, um, the usual suspect cities like 
Los Angeles, San Francisco, these are 60 mile urban structured cities, right? And uh, a city like Miami, it's urban structure, it's about 100 miles. So there is a huge difference in size. Uh, and this is a very fundamental thought. When you place an urban air mobility system, right, in a Latin American city that it's only 16 miles across, that means that the legs between vertiports are way shorter. And that adds a value for mobility, very short flights. And that could be reflected into very low altitude flights. So the question is, and to the points that you guys touched is, how can that become an easier way or an easier place to actually implement urban air mobility first and acquire this know-how? What's the value of Latin America to actually be a location where we can implement urban mobility at a reduced cost because all that simplicity reflects back into, into costs. So uh, what's that opportunity that we're probably seeing in Latin America for the global UAM stakeholders? And I wanna give it over to, uh, to Michael from the economics and then circle back to the rest of you guys. Sure, um, so we've determined um, that the, uh, uh, the, the economic benefit city by city is driven by quite a number of factors. I'll give you just a couple of examples. One is uh, the existing uh, heliport structure in cities um, because it is expensive to build uh, a new heliport or vertiport as the term goes, uh, also multi-ports. Um, and uh, so the formula is really uh, the, the investment cost um, needs to be offset by the potential revenue production. We use a ratio of R over I, which means um, network revenues divided by infrastructure costs. It's a very simple uh, ratio, but any city that has a number above two and a half, uh, there's a business case there. And there's also a business case to attract private capital. Uh, many public transportation systems um, don't have that R over I percentage. And the, the public dole has to be made use of to, uh, to build and operate these. But with urban air mobility, it's a very unique prospect. The overall infrastructure costs, relatively speaking, is very low. And uh, the, the benefits delivered should be extremely high. Um, and uh, as we mentioned earlier, as traffic increases, uh, costs will come down uh, dramatically. So there's good news here for, um, you know, people who are in the mainstream of, of the economy. And I, th I think that that's uh, very relevant to ask uh, Edgar to, to convey to us, and this is one of the questions that we're seeing in the Q's and A's right now, it's what's the position of the Colombian aeronautics authorities? Because uh, we, we could uh, do this in such a way that as private industry, which is simply imposed, but what we're doing is actually working together with the regulators because we're aware that we need to create uh, the regulatory environment. And that means writing new regulations, not only trying to fit this new generation of aircraft and aviation or urban mobility into the existing uh, regulation parts and chapters, but rather build an entirely new uh, regulations environment. So uh, the realization from the Colombian Aeronautics Authorities that they can be instrumental in being part of the solution to the mobility problem and the lack of infrastructure, is, is a, it's key. So uh, I'd like Edgar to uh, convey that to us because I think that's very important. Bien, eh, en cuanto a la, a la necesidad de, de regulación, es claro que eh, toda la, la, la experiencia que tenemos y que es eh, en materia de regulación aeronáutica y que es la misma de todos los estados en consideración a que todos eh, nos movemos en la misma dirección eh, estandarizados alrededor de, la, de lo que propone la Organización de Aviación Civil Internacional de tal manera que la, que la regulación y la, y la condición regulatoria con pequeñas diferencias va siendo más o menos la misma. Y la regulación tendría que ir primeramente a considerar eh, ciertas condiciones mínimas de aeronavegabilidad, llamamos en el medio aeronáutico, de aptitud técnica de los equipos de vuelo, llámese aeronave, llámese, llámese vehículo o, o carro, volante, como algunos que han llamado, debe reunir unas condiciones mínimas de aeronavegabilidad que nos garanticen un vuelo seguro. Y, 
en cuanto a su, estru su estructura, su sus equipos, la, 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 la seguridad, la certeza de que, de que el aparato va a volar con seguridad general. Entonces, las primeras normas serían condiciones técnicas propias intrínsecas del vehículo. En segundo lugar, una regulación debería contemplar eh, unas condiciones operativas. ¿Cómo se va a operar? ¿Cómo operará este aparato de tal manera que no interfiera adversamente con las operaciones aéreas convencionales? ¿Y cómo operará este aparato de tal manera también que no genere congestiones, que no genere colisiones entre ellos, que no genere colisiones, que es otra realidad que, que, que tangible, que es la de lo, los drones no tripulados, eh, cómo evitar que colisiones con estos en espacios aéreos a baja altura. Entonces, esta regulación eh, orientada a la operación y al tránsito de estas aeronaves tendría que estar contemplada. Y finalmente, sin que sean los únicos, pero digamos lo más importante, algunos requerimientos en cuanto a... Eh, a, a quien deba, en el caso de que los aparatos sean tripulados, a quien deba tripularlos. Acá este, esto tiene mucho más complejidad de la que parece porque cuál es la intención seguramente es que este aparato o no sea tripulado o sea tripulado por una persona de la manera más sencilla posible. O sea, la, la, no creemos que sea necesario que o quien opera una de estas aeronaves tenga los conocimientos, habilidades, pericias de, de, de un piloto de aeronave convencional, de una aeronave convencional. Entonces, la regulación debería orientarse a establecer un, lo, lo, lo más sencillo posible, pero sí unas condiciones mínimas que garanticen que sea capaz de operarlo con seguridad en el evento de que el aparato fuese, fuese tripulado, o unas condiciones mínimas que, que garanticen que el servicio se preste adecuadamente en el, en el evento de que el aparato sea no tripulado. Es decir, las las condiciones de la regulación irían a, enfocadas a estos tres elementos, sobre todo a los dos primeros. Ahora bien, como les decía en un comienzo, es necesario que se integre entonces a la regulación propia del transporte aéreo urbano, porque la regulación del transporte urbano en todas las ciudades del mundo pues tiene unas condiciones que no se pueden desconocer, no puede operar de una manera, de una manera divorciada. Y... Eh, Posiblemente sea, y a propósito de lo que mencionaba, de lo que mencionaba Michael, ciertamente, eh, en, cuanto, en cuanto a los, uh, los Berry Pads o a helipuertos en su caso, pensando en utilizar helipuertos convencionales, de cualquier manera, también seguramente habría que establecer algunas normas eh, en cuanto a la operatividad, ya sea el, el uso compartido de helipuertos o el uso de plataformas específicas para eh, operar estos vehículos. En el caso colombiano, por cierto, y, y un poco atendiendo una inquietud que planteaba Michael, yo creo que debe ser seguramente algo similar en otras ciudades. Eh, sí, muchas edificaciones, muchos edificios altos tienen el impuesto porque hay regulaciones en materia urbanística que exigen que los edificios que tengan más de X cantidad de altura o cantidad de pisos, no tengo claro exactamente cuánto, pero normas urbanísticas le exigen que por encima de determinada altura los edificios tengan el impuesto pensando más en, en eventuales emergencias, más que en, en servicios. De tal manera que, que edificios altos es, es muy usual que lo tengan, pero de cualquier manera... Eh, habría que establecer regulaciones que permitan o que estos helipuertos sean utilizados por estos vehículos o algunas específicas para las plataformas que habría de utilizarse, al igual que las pertinentes a los, a los corredores que habrían de utilizarse. Entonces, digamos que la regulación tendría que apuntar a estos aspectos. Eh, en el caso de Colombia, eh, la intención es que la, la, la regulación en general, y es la tendencia eh, actual, es que la regulación, si bien es cierto, las regulaciones aeronáuticas tienden a ser exigentes por el nivel de seguridad que persiguen, pero se busca también que sea lo más sencilla y flexible hasta donde sea posible para estimular en todos los sentidos el crecimiento del, de, del transporte aéreo y de la industria, y desde luego dentro de esta de el gran ola eh, entraría la posibilidad también para los vehículos no tripulados. Lo corrigen, lo, los vehículos de, de movilidad urbana tripulados o no. Very cool. Anybody wants to add any thoughts to that?
Did you say my name? I could, yeah. I mean, this is a conversation, so please. Oh, no, it's in. just I didn't get audio. So yeah, I was I... asking if anybody wants to uh, add any thoughts to that. In other okay. words, uh, the, the fact that we need to, uh, to create the regulations, uh, to create that environment, and uh, to generate the possibility under um, regulated, uh, regulated system for this to operate. And it's a new way of operation. We're not talking about the, the, the typical heliports. Uh, we can repurpose heliports, but this is about urban air mobility. It's a, it's a matter of a uh, different way to serve people. And we need to uh, not only think about that aeronautical part, but integrating into the rest of the transportation modes. So this does involve micro mobility. It involves uh, the first and last mile problem. How do you get to a vertiport in the first place? And I think um, Latin America has a lot of those assets under construction right now, both on the regulation side and on the actual business uh, 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 businesses that are arising. So, uh, yeah. If I may, uh, Felipe, on the regulatory side, I think uh, building the urban air mobility ecosystem and the whole infrastructure around it, so we should all learn something from commercial aviation. When I spoke to CEOs of uh, companies like Viva or JetSmart, one thing that was keeping them awake at night is different regulations in different countries. And it's really hard to invest. It's really hard to plan anything unless there is some sort of consistency, especially if we're talking about men stipulated vehicles. We're talking about training, licensing for engineers, uh, for pilots. Uh, uh, an opportunity for Latin America is not only about Latin America, it's about also global investors coming and investing in different countries that need to migrate from uh, traditional transportation to urban air mobility. Those investors will be more attracted if they can see some consistency in regulations. If they well, want I can, to set up... Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Tamara. Go ahead, please. I would like to add that uh, we feel that there are four supply chains uh, that must uh, be involved and coordinate efforts uh, for urban air mobility to be viable on a city by city basis. So this Tamara builds on your point. Um, the four supply chains are, are simply, we begin with operators. Those are often part 135 helicopter operators today who are the best suited to be able to uh, take on and incorporate um, electric vehicles for operations. Number two, it's the um, uh, manufacturers themselves of those vehicles and that entire supply chain, which creates wonderful opportunities in cities and locations in Central and South America. There's real revenue growth potential there. Uh, thirdly is uh, ground infrastructure. Uh, we estimate that for uh, Bogota, uh, there would be a requirement for about $40 million US of investment to build out the heliport network uh, to about 20 nodes. And that can provide the, the, the network effect necessary to make it, um, uh, make it profitable. And the last is the uh, UATM, the traffic management side of this. So we all know that these vehicles will uh, in the next decade or so be uh, able to fly autonomously. And that's a good thing. Uh, we'll need less pilots. There's a shortage anyway today. And we can, uh, we can uh, sidestep pilot error, which is another critical problem and probably the key vulnerability in urban air mobility networks. So it will start uh, slowly, but build. And those four supply chains um, uh, must um, coordinate and uh, 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 be invested in or invest in um, the simultaneous um, assembly of the necessary components for, uh, for a profitable network. You have to have, in the end, operators that can make money. Um, and so to get there, those four supply chains have to uh, be coordinated and will depend on consortia, city consortia, city by city, with regulators involved, uh, the local governments, the city uh, mayor's office, uh, economic development agencies and the like. You see, there's so many interesting points that, uh, that uh, we would like to touch uh, that the economics of it is so relevant. Um, and it's so hard to plan on, right? When you have so many variables, the mobility, then we haven't even mentioned the origin of the energy to operate these systems in the first place. And that's a huge question that mm -hmm. again, that, that uh, 
um, also connects to the environmental question. And uh, I know Natalia is very much into this environmental point. Uh, and and I, I, I think that uh, I, I just want to throw out there another value that we have seen in Latin America, and it's tourism. All the tourism applications that we have spoken with the Colombian CAA as well. You see, urban mobility is not just only about transportation on a daily basis. It's also about the new opportunities. Can we move people between islands in a better way? Can we offer new possibilities for, for tourism? Latin America and Colombia in particular is a country that has all its future to be built around uh, uh, what we call orange economies. And, and uh, that's very relevant right now with the current government in Colombia, but it has to do a lot with tourism and new ways of tourism. So uh, I don't know if any of you wanna throw any ideas on that in our remaining minutes here before we go into uh, questions and answers. I can talk about the energy a little bit, especially environment. And when developing, in, and, and going back to regulation, when developing a new system, I think there's such a unique opportunity because the regulations have not been made. And it gives a chance to get them right because it's so much easier to implement certain regulations and pricing rather than implementing the wrong ones and then going back. And the same goes for the energy efficiency. When there is a certain system efficiency, how can we manipulate the users to achieve system optimum in terms also from energy? And how can we maybe, instead of the passengers strictly moving people, we can use those systems for other needs such as e-commerce and package delivery? which that's a really fast growing system. So what incentives are we going to give people to, let's say, offset their travel from work to home uh, to equalize the energy use throughout the system? Yeah, we have all these opportunities, freight transportation, patient transportation, uh, tourism. What, what does this do, Jake, from a historian's point of view to open doors for implementation, actual implementation now? Well, uh on that aspect, but you also have the, the efficiency and Natalia talked and Michael did as well talked about trying to get the system efficient. And if you can get it efficient, then you can move people, you can move passengers. I read someplace that something like 90% of the energy of moving a car down the road is moving the car down the road. And then you're happen to be in the car, but you're a very small weight portion of the weight, how much the car weighs. It's the same thing with autonomy. If you have a two person urban air vehicle, and it, one of them has to be a pilot, you, that person's just taking up the weight just to drive the machine. If you have autonomy, you can either have a two place or a four place if you have much larger vehicles later down the road. And if you have a four place vehicle, but none of those four people has to be a pilot, you are now moving those four people and they're all four are paying, none of them is just being there to drive the machine. Uh, so you've seen that historically as well and you see that uh, airplanes developed mostly to, to carry mail for the first part, and then later aircraft developed to have passengers along with the mail, and then pretty soon it was efficient enough that you could operate with just passengers. And now more lately you have passenger aircraft and often carrying cargo in the bay. So it's definitely a mixture between uh, the economics of moving people and moving goods, uh, and, and they all intertwine together. Yeah, and that's an interesting point about transitioning from uh, manned vehicles, whether they are commercial aircraft uh, or uh, other type of vehicles to unmanned vehicles and the perception of that around the world. And I assume also in, in Latin America, two years ago, I was uh, in Brussels at a conference which talked about uh, artificial intelligence and airspace. And Gracia Vitadini from Airbus, their chief technology officer, was saying how Airbus is slowly preparing for a single uh, piloted commercial aircraft. And everybody around the world looked at themselves and said, oh, I'm not going to fly that. So I think we're talking about years and years of education and uh, safety proving and testing before we are actually able to have customer acceptance of the fact that they're flying unmanned vehicle. And that's not a drone as a toy. Absolutely. So uh, I want to thank everybody for, for uh, all these very, very uh, interesting insights. And it's definitely an interesting conversation about urban air mobility. Uh, I want to jump into uh, our questions and answers uh, slot. Uh, 
Andres, what do we have uh, from our uh, attendees? Okay, well, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm gonna read a couple of questions that the attendees have made. And uh, of course, uh, I will not tell all of them because they are a lot right now. But I'm gonna start with the question made by Matt Sassero, uh, which um, is the next thing. Uh, so, do you see an opportunity an, an opportunity for Colombia to lead or to at least to push in some of these technical and regulatory are areas, especially in these very specific slash geographically tailored use case or morphology industries and or ICAO? I think uh, that's a question for uh, Edgar. Uh, do we see Colombia leading in urban mobility or following the FAA, or is it a leader that we're planning on being? What's, what's our view there? Eh, bien, eh, sin desconocer la importancia que, que pues, representa para nosotros desde Colombia la perspectiva que puedan tener eh, nuestros interlocutores que están desde fuera, para nosotros es igualmente importante saber cómo nos ven desde fuera. Sí, puedo decir que que Colombia sí tiene todas las condiciones para, para ser líder o por lo menos ser uno, uno de los países eh, punteros eh, en este proceso. En primer lugar, porque no solamente estaremos hablando de la mera movilidad urbana para ciudades congestionadas, sino también, ya que ha sido mencionado el tráfico turístico, Colombia tiene puntos eh, turísticos bien importantes. Puedo hablarles de la ciudad de, de, de Cartagena, de hecho es mi ciudad natal, En esta ciudad eh, se ha prestado el servicio de, de, de paseos turísticos con helicóptero, dado que la ciudad tiene muchos atractivos, mucho para mostrar desde el aire. Lamentablemente eh, no es una actividad muy exitosa desde el punto de vista económico, nuevamente por el elevado costo de operación de los helicópteros, pero eh, tiene ese atractivo y este es solo un ejemplo. Hay muchos lugares donde se puede hacer el, 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 este transporte también con propósitos turísticos. Adicional a, a esto y, a, y a, la movilidad, a la mera movilidad urbana, el uso en ambulancia, otros usos que han sido mencionados, el transporte de paquetería o mensajería, desde luego eh, eh, habría mucha actividad que hacer acá, al igual que en cualquier otra parte, pero otro elemento eh, que pudiera apoyar es que eh, Hay también la posibilidad en Colombia en, en cuanto a que hay una, una industria aeronáutica, si bien es cierto, no, no, no muy robusta, al menos sí la suficiente, tiene la robustez suficiente como para eh, brindar soporte, soporte técnico, obviamente con la vida, preparación y entrenamiento para brindar soporte técnico en su momento, eh, trabajar quizá en el, en el ensamblaje de los vehículos, en su mantenimiento, etcétera. Hay toda la posibilidad porque hay, hay, una, hay, hay suficiente capacidad para esto, eh, de modo pues que sería mm, esta otra más de las posibilidades, además de la de la capacidad regulatoria que tiene el Estado en cuanto se pueda necesitar. Pero pienso que mm, tan importante como la opinión mía desde Colombia es importante también para quienes nos ven desde afuera. Andrés. Okay, the next question I'm going to read is uh, from David Russell. He asks, everyone talks about safety, but can you define that? IEC 61508, functional safety, FAA formula, the risk calculus changes between piloted aircraft and autonomous systems. So I think this is a question about uh, autonomy. Uh, very, very relevant. Um, of course, autonomy is uh, broad subject. Uh, uh, we have to define what autonomous means when we, when we fly an aircraft today and the new VTOLs are, are going to be uh, highly uh, automated because a human being cannot control so many variables. Um, but that as well means that they're probably easier to operate. And autonomy may mean safer vehicles, but does that mean pilot less? air vehicles. Is that culturally accepted, in other words, by regulators? And is it something that the public will adopt? I don't know if any, any one of you uh, want to jump into that. Well, I, I think from 
perception point of view because that's how I understood the context of your response. Uh, I think eventually they will. How long it will take and how much money needs to be invested in education and uh, testing, 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 because we know some of the European uh, players in EV toll, they made big announcements, uh, they had uh, very unsuccessful tests. Uh, so there is this divided public opinion. On one hand, it's very attractive, it's very sexy, everybody's looking forward to this new way of getting transported, but on the other hand, uh, there is a big fear of flying in autonomous vehicle. I would oh, also yeah. like to exercise caution when we, I really like this question and I'm very passionate about safety. And there are two branches of safety. One relies on technology and automation. The other one is of feeling safe. It's your perceived safety as a passenger. Because in the Latin American context, it, context and global context, there have been groups of people that have been historically overlooked in transportation, such as women and minorities. They pay the same price for transportation, but they do not experience the same level of service and they do not have the same experiences. So safety from technological perspective, absolutely, but also how do we change perceived safety as right now some groups do not feel safe on transit? How do we make them feel safe in an alternate mode of transportation. And that's a great point because I read a recent study which says that women are made decision makers when it comes to choosing the mode of transportation of their families and close people. I would add uh, one experience that uh, I heard about in our Vancouver project. Um, in 1985, uh, the city introduced um, uh, subway uh, services uh, where the cars were autonomous. 1985, uh, no, no driver. And uh, uh, most of the city before 1985, uh, people said they'd never get on one of these vehicles uh, without seeing a driver in command. But that very quickly morphed into uh, one of the most popular ride systems uh, in North America. So I think these perceptions can be undone uh, provided uh, the industry provides proof. And that proof will be hard earned but uh, it's obviously coming. Fully agree with that. So um, because of uh, time, I'm uh, unfortunately needing to uh, close this very, very interesting think tank. Um, I, I think that there are so many subjects that need to be covered and that are being worked by all of uh, uh, us players in urban mobility and uh, each from us uh, from the different perspectives that we have in our different disciplines because urban mobility definitely it's a, it's a broad industry that needs to bring together a whole bunch of different bits and pieces and, and like a jigsaw puzzle, make them fit uh, from the air vehicles and, and then the regulations, the airspace integration architecture, and then uh, everything else on the urban side, which is probably bigger than you have the operation inside the vertiports, passenger management, the business cases, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's really interesting. That is what we're doing. And uh, I want to thank our, our uh, think tankers, our panelists here, um, Edgar, Jake, uh, Tamara, Natalia, and Michael. Um, we are uh, delighted to have you uh, be part of this uh, effort and this ecosystem and uh, your insights are really, really valuable. Uh, we do not have the answers to all the questions. We definitely do know the direction we need to walk and I think that's valuable and that's where we're headed. So um, with that, I just want to close this thing, this thing thing by thanking you and uh, I want to thank our attendees to, uh, for having joined us and uh, for their questions. I, I see a few that were left there. So unfortunately, because of time, we uh, are, we're not able to answer all of them. Hopefully- Maybe uh, you could email us questions and we can send we, answers. We can definitely do that. And I'd like to uh, do that uh, on, our, on the couple of questions that were left there, absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, many of these will probably be answered in our coming think tanks. Uh, we have uh, many other topics that we're going to be covering. Uh, the next think tank is about the air vehicles, the actual aircraft that are going to be required in Latin America. Uh, it's going to be held on August the 20th. So uh, you're welcome to join us and register to that one and all the rest of our think tanks. Uh, thank you all very much. It was exciting to have you and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Muchísimas gracias, Felipe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody.